know and to love Him more. Well, this morning as we come to God's Word, our text is from Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 16. Philippians 3, 12 to 16, if you'd turn there in your copy of God's Word. As mentioned last week, Philippians has two main themes in it. The first is joy and rejoicing, those two words being used 17 times in that short epistle. And also the idea of unity or fellowship. And both of these around Christ. Our text today focuses primarily on fellowship or unity of Christ. Last week in Philippians 3 and 7 to 11, Paul focused on the accounting terms of gain and loss to help us understand what the basis of unity was, particularly what things were of true gain and what things must be considered as loss. Well, this week he switches to address primarily athletic terms to help us see how unity of Christ is to be pursued in our lives. Now, we all understand the pursuit of a goal and know so from the youngest age as children. That is what are our hopes, our dreams, our desires, and our goals. I remember when I was young, people used to come to me and say, young man, what do you want to be when you grow up? Incidentally, I, like some of you, am still trying to answer that question. But as a small boy, I wanted to be an astronaut, you see. In the 60s, it was the beginning of the space age. Uh, uh, John Glenn had gone and orbited the Earth. Uh, the space race with the Soviet Union was beginning. We were talking about going to land on the moon. I was very excited about that. And our goals continue to progress throughout our lives. As we get into high school, these goals are taking shape in our life. And, you know, as we celebrated our graduates uh, the last couple weeks here and had the privilege this morning of hear, hearing a bit from the Richards kids all in high school, we start to understand where are we going and, and what are we doing. And our goals are taking shape. At graduation, we may enter the workforce perhaps trade school or, or some even college. And all of these are because of the specific direction or goals in our lives, that which we're pursuing. And oftentimes, of course, these goals change as we go through our lives. Many will change their goals as they go through college and change their major. I did. Furthermore, the majority of Americans will have a significant career change somewhere in their mid-30s to 50s. And all of this as a function of how we see ourselves and what we desire to pursue in our lives. And our text addresses this very issue, and it's where our title comes from. How do you regard yourselves? How do you regard yourselves? Philippians 3, 12 to 16 is our text. Let me read it, and then we'll share a few comments if you'd follow along in your copy of God's Word. Philippians chapter 3 beginning in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. Praise God for His word. How do you regard yourselves? This takes us to our first point, which I've titled, Pressing On. Pressing On. Paul begins verse 12 by indicating a change of his argument from the former text by using the negation not. And he connects that negation with the two ideas through the word already. Not that I have already obtained that, or I have already become perfect. And a question arose in my mind, what has he not obtained? 
In what has he not been made perfect? The New American Standard adds the word it in italics. The English Standard Version adds the word this, all to draw our attention to the fact that there is something here to, the, to which we must ask the question, what is it or what is this? Well, what he is talking about is the fulfillment of his faith in being made like Christ, the subject of our previous verses. In fact, jump back up to verse 7 with me where it says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And there it is. This is the goal, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. He uses in verse 12 this past tense verb, obtain, as of this very moment of his writing to the church in Philippi, he realizes he's not yet there. He's not yet obtained it. And then he uses the passive form of being made perfect, that is, that God who makes all things perfect has not as yet brought perfection to his spiritual life. William Hendrickson notes, Paul fully believed in God's sovereign calling and choosing of him by which God would make him perfect. But he wasn't there yet. And alongside of complete trust in God's plan of election was that this would not occur without his human responsibility to obtain it through his efforts, end quote. Yes, beloved, salvation is all of God. It is all by grace. And we know, per Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works so that no one may boast. Yes, our salvation is all of God's doing. And yet, we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So there is God's sovereignty and there is human responsibility that are working together. And Paul is bringing those to our attention in this text. It's an ongoing work for us of pursuing Christ-likeness. Theologians call this sanctification. Growing in holiness, growing away from our sin and the sin nature that exists in our flesh and growing towards Christ. Paul's initial assessment of how he regards himself is not there yet. And this can be frustrating from our own lives too, can it? I've been a Christian 5 or 10 or 30 or 50 years and I'm still struggling. I still sin. And when we do, our natural tendency can be to throw up our arms and say, fine, I'm a failure, I can't do this, there's no way, I just continue in this path. And even to say, I quit. Is that the right response? No, not at all. Rather, Paul says in verse 12, but I press on. Of course, here's our first point, pressing on. No, beloved, we must not become weary in doing good, but we must press on. Even the great apostle struggled in this area of his life. Do you remember Romans chapter 7? First half of the chapter, he talks about his life before salvation under the law. The second half speaks of his salvation. And we would think of this glorious diatribe of all that God's done in his great accomplishments, but no. He says, the things that I want to do those I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those I do. Wretched man that I am. Better now? Testing? Are we on? Okay, good, excellent. So we'll press ahead. Um, no pun intended. Well, this Greek word press on is used to describe the action 
of a runner at the beginning of his race. We've all seen this in the Olympics. We've seen a sprinter come behind the line, his blocks there. He places his feet firmly in those blocks, sets his toes against the bottom, slightly bent, the foot firmly against the base of the block. He wipes his hands off and he sets his fingers on each side of the line and comes into a set position. Every body, every muscle in his body, tense and ready to fire at the starter's gun. And as it goes off, boom, he is out like a shot, not coming up but staying down, focusing all his energy forward to get all of his speed and momentum moving ahead. This is the perspective of the pressing on that we must do in our Christian's life. And as we see at the end of verse 12, what we're to press on towards the end of verse 12, it says, But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. We press on so that we may lay hold. That word lay hold means to attain or to win or better yet to make my own. This is not a faint or remote effort as if some mindless accomplishing of a task with little commitment. This is a, a personal, focused, all-out effort. Paul makes a beautiful parallel statement in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12 where he writes, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight. There's, there's an effort required here. Now, if you go out and get in a street fight and don't do this, but if you do, you better be ready to put forth some effort because if you just kind of walk out there and, okay, I'm going to get in a fight, you're going to get your clock cleaned. No, it takes some effort. You've got to be ready for that fight. And you have to take hold of that role that we're being called to, to eternal life. And make no mistake, beloved, we are in a fight. Our flesh wars against God's spirit in us, as Galatians 5.17 tells us. This is a fight. This is a battle. And we must be ready for it. And what Paul is seeking to lay hold of is that for which he was laid hold of in Christ Jesus. Christ laid hold of Paul on the Damascus Road. Make no mistake literally struck him blind and later restored his sight so that he would be an apostle to the Gentiles. Christ fully apprehended Paul to the Christian ministry. And Paul was fully absorbed in that effort. Look back at verse 3 to see what he says about this in Philippians 3 and 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul is all in. It's not my flesh. It's not me. This is God. I'm all about this. But even in this, he hadn't arrived, as verse 12 exclaims. But beloved, we recognize something very, very important. And that which is a critical component here. And it is Paul's state of mind. He's not defeated or downcast. Oh, I hate this sin. I'm never going to get by it. I hate this struggle with my flesh. I just want to be by it. I'm, I'm not going to make it through. He's not a, a glass half empty attitude. Oh, woe is me. Everything's just so horrible in the world. Everything's going downhill. Everything I look at's a mess. No, but he has a confident, positive perspective on what God's doing. Knowing that we've read the end of the book and we win. In our own strength, no, we're nothing. But all things are possible through Christ who calls us, who strengthens us, and who lives in us. Although not yet obtaining and not yet perfect, we must press on. And Paul carries this idea forward into our next point, which I've titled, Reaching Up. Reaching Up. Look at verse 13 with me. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Paul begins our second point by re-emphasizing his audience. Brethren, those genuine believers in the church in Philippi. And he does so for emphasis. He wants to make a point and say, are you paying attention? Brethren, hear me. This is a big point that you need to recognize. And then he restates the most dramatic terms, in that which he's just concluded in verse 12. Paul uses three first-person pronouns to begin this Greek sentence. I don't recall ever seeing a more dramatic construction in all of the Greek text. He literally says, I myself, I do not regard having laid hold of it. He wants there to be no misunderstanding about where he is in the process. And where he is is not yet there. And by the way, if Paul wasn't there, the Philippians weren't there either, nor are we. This serves as a warning to those who think they've arrived spiritually and no longer need to pursue Christ. Oh, I've been a believer for a long time. I read the word, I pray. Everything's going great for me. I don't really have to think about this anymore. No. And it's also an encouragement for those who are struggling. For instance, if Paul is still pursuing Howard after Christ, maybe it's okay that we're struggling and need to continue and be exhorted to pursue hard after Christ. And then he gives us this huge statement of personal affirmation. But one thing I do. It's like saying, no, I'm not there yet, but let me assure you that this is always my endeavor. And he gives us that endeavor at the end of verse 13. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. This is, is such a, a powerful statement for us. The first point of this massive, massively emphatically point is forgetting what lies behind. I don't think there's anyone alive on this planet who does not understand what Paul means here. We all have mistakes in our lives, haven't we? Are there events in your life you wish hadn't happened? Things in our lives that cause great regret? Actions you've taken? Words you've spoken that you wish you could take back? Or words that you haven't spoken and wish that you had? But you can't take them back any more than you can change history. I have so many of these things in my life that I wish I could change. I had hoped to be the senior pastor in Mobile, Alabama till the Lord took me home or till he returned. I don't know what I could have done to change that, but it's done and behind me. I can't call a do-over. It's in the past and that's where it must remain. I just had a dear friend fly in to uh, play golf with me. I'm not a golfer. I go out a couple times a year. And so we're playing along and I'm not hitting one or two or three bad shots, but you know, two, three, four, seven, eight, a hole. And I'm kind of, uh, 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 you know, grousing around. And, and Wayne comes up and he goes, do you remember the Lion King? And I said, well, sure. He goes, you remember the monkey, the colorful face, Rafiki? And I said, sure. And he slugs me in the shoulder. I mean, he gives it to me. And I'm like, dude, what is that for? And he said, remember what Rafiki said? It's all in the past. Forget about it. That's exactly the point. It's in the past. We can't do anything more about it. And Paul is saying, forget about it. It's in the past. Leave it there. Learn from it and be done. Move on. There are some of you here today who are struggling massively in this area, living in the past, wishing you could change this or that, past regrets, wrongly or unspoken words. Well, beloved, you cannot. So move on. Listen to Paul and forget what lies behind. And this can apply to negative as well as positive items. Oh, I was the high school football star. Well, you're not anymore. That's in the past. <laughs> Leave it behind. So whether it's past failures 
or accomplishments, leave them where they must remain in the past and then do the next thing, reaching forward to what lies ahead. And here's our second point, reaching up. Paul returns to this descriptive term of a runner. The runner is singularly focused as is Paul when he says, but one thing I do. This is a statement of complete commitment. He's forgetting what lies behind. Whatever mistakes happened earlier in the race, they must be forgotten. Now he is reaching forward. This is an extremely graphic portrayal of a runner reaching for the finish line. All of his physical, all of his mental, all of his emotional strength striving to get to that tape. We've all seen Olympic runners with running as hard as they can and striving and throwing that arm out, sometimes to the point of losing balance and falling to the asphalt track. This is the effort and the focus that Paul's talking about. And then in verse 14, we see the goal of his efforts. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing on is the same verb we saw back in verse 12. And this is toward the goal. Now the point of all of this is revealed. The word goal can also be translated as mark or a singular point that all of our effort and all of our energies are striving towards. This is the point and focus of reaching forward. The finish line to which the runner is singularly focused in this race because in reaching the goal comes what that goal is in the next term and it is the prize. Paul describes this prize in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, where he writes, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable what is the prize? The prize is eternal life. The prize is the imperishable nature of that which God will give to us when we meet Jesus Christ. And that prize is described in the last part of verse 14. It is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The upward call is God's effectual call of salvation placed upon his children that undeniable and irrevocable call that God gives to everyone who knows him. Paul explains this call further in 2 Timothy 1, 9. 2 Timothy 1 and 9 reads, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. This is God's calling upon our lives. This is the purpose for which we have been brought onto this earth. The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what it's all for, beloved. This is why we race day by day with all of our strength, with all of our might to fulfill the call placed upon us. Paul was struck on the Damascus road and he saw the risen Christ. And every one of you who are here and know Jesus Christ as your savior have had just as powerful and just as direct a call. Because that's how God works. He speaks to each of us directly and personally. Peter describes it this way in 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are called to this living hope. We are called to understand that we are born again. We are born new. And that through Christ's resurrection. And what is the purpose? To obtain an inheritance with this fourfold aspect, which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. How important is this call you've received? How perfect is it? It is that which will never perish, 
It will go on eternally. It is that which cannot be defiled. It is that which won't fade and which God has reserved for you. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is what we're pressing on towards. And if you don't understand this, it might be because you don't understand the gospel. You don't recognize that we all fall short in our sin. You may still be thinking that your sin's okay. You have appeased your conscience that the things that you're doing are all right. Well, they are not. And you know that. And because of that sin, we are separated from God for all eternity. And if God is righteous and just and holy, and he is, he must punish every sin, every single sin, every single thought, every single action. And either we will pay for them for all eternity, separated from God, or we will accept Christ's payment on the cross where the Father placed all of the sins upon his Son. And this we must recognize, and we must understand that this is what we're pressing towards. And if these things don't strike in your heart that this is imperishable and undefiled and reserved in heaven for you, maybe you need to stop and get right with the Lord. And after the service is over, come and see one of our leaders. Get on your knees and plead to Christ that he would open your eyes to salvation. You know, a great illustration of these verses, of this pressing on and reaching up, is in the story of a, a pastor's ocean baptism of a teenager. Now, I may have told this before, but like a friend of my dad says, if I have, just uh, don't interrupt and listen quietly because I like telling the story. <laughs> but there's this pastor who takes this young teenager that wants to be baptized into the ocean. This won't happen July 10th out at Eagle Island State Park. You'll be fine. He takes this young teenager out into the ocean. They're, they're into their waist. Soon they're into the pastor's shoulders and the young teenager is not as tall as the pastor so he's kind of bobbing a little bit up and down and he gets out there to where the pastor is just holding him and he's sort of floating in the salt water and the pastor says a few words and then puts him under the water and he holds him under the water and the kids start struggling a little bit and he holds him under the water and the kids starts thrashing and fighting and he holds him under the water and he's reaching up and a bubble or two comes up and finally, the pastor lifts him out of the water. And the kid's spitting water and hollering at the pastor, what was that about? And the pastor goes, when you want Christ like you wanted that breath, then you're ready to be baptized. This is what our focus has to be. And this is an extreme story, but it represents what must be our passion and our zeal for reaching up towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our third point carries it forward, striving forward. Pressing on, reaching up, and striving forward. Paul begins our third point in verse 15 where he says, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude... God will reveal that also to you. We move now to a particular group within the church, and that is the mature. The New American Standard translates this as perfect, which is another adequate translation, but it's really best understood as mature, as most of our modern versions use. Perfect comes from the King James Version and the Old Latin Vulgate and conveys a sense of finality in the process, which clearly is not what Paul has shown in our prior verses. So now he addresses the mature Christian and he says, have this attitude. Well, again, our natural question is what attitude? And the answer is the same as before, all the way back to verses 7 and 8. The attitude of attaining the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In short, the pursuit of Christ likeness. And in that, the realization that none has arrived. This is why perfect is not the best translation. 
And verse 15 goes on, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. When he says, if in anything, he is talking about secondary doctrinal issues. Secondary matters of concern. It's not that secondary doctrinal matters are not important. They're absolutely important, but not alongside of pursuing holiness and sanctification. That is the paramount concern. So he says, if you have other concerns, God will reveal it to you. Now, he isn't saying this from some arrogant perspective like some so-called Christians are when they stand back, oh, one day you'll be as enlightened as I am. No, that's not what he's saying at all. Rather, he is saying, if you are mature, that is, you're growing in Christ, understanding where you need to be, and you're completely and wholeheartedly seeking Christ, then you'll come to understand these matters. God will reveal them to you. This is exactly what Jesus said in John 6, 45. The Lord said in John 6 and 45, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. If we're earnestly pursuing God, those matters that we're not absolutely clear on, God will reveal them to us. But first, we must be pursuing holiness and Christ-likeness with all of our being. Then he brings his closing admonition in verse 16. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. He begins this verse with however, and this is a, a very unique Greek word. There are several words in the Greek language that can be translated however. This one is a very unique one, and it is significantly emphatic. He is saying, regardless of our maturity our, or our agreement on secondary doctrine, don't miss this point. And that point is keep living by the standard that you've attained. The point of maturity, that is the level of Christ-likeness, the amount of holiness or sanctification that you have reached, don't lose it. Don't be backslidden. Keep that standard. The word here is a military term, meaning to hold the line or to stay in rank. And if you are serving in the military and you are put into ranks and you step out, there will be serious consequences. And the point here is don't shirk back. Beloved, as we grow in maturity, a lot of things change in our lives, don't they? Our physical strength will dwindle. I had a yard of dirt in the back of my pickup that I unloaded with a shovel this week. The next morning, I thought I was going to need Karen and an engine jack to get me out of bed. Our mental faculties will diminish. We'll forget our keys more. We'll not remember what we're saying more often. But our spiritual growth must not decline. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 16. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Yes, I'm not as strong as I used to be. I'm way slower than I used to be. Significantly larger around the middle than I used to be. Don't remember like I used to, but my spiritual maturity must be growing. Our physical decline is not a function of our spiritual growth. Quite the contrary. This is our focus in striving forward. So where are we in our pursuit of Christ-likeness? Or as our title says, how do you regard yourselves? We began by talking about young people and what they want to be when they grow up. Well, what about you? What is your focus that is, do you recognize your great need to grow in Christ-likeness? Ask yourselves these questions today. Do I realize that there is a spiritual race in front of me that I must run? Do I realize that I must stop holding on to past defeats as well as past successes 
so that I can run unencumbered? Do I realize that I have a mental attitude that must understand God's work and his ultimate success in my race? Do I always remember that it is God who is working in and through me so as to win this race? I'd like to ask you to reach in front of you and take out a hymnal. Take out one of those black books, those hymnals in front of you. There's a lot around. Look around. If somebody doesn't have one, help out your brother or sister. And turn to hymn 394. 394. We're not going to sing this hymn. I don't think it's one that we've yet sung here at church. The words are so impactful. It's one of my favorite hymns. Perhaps we can add it to our repertoire one day. But rather than just reading it to you, I wanted you to see the words in this song and ask yourself how they reflect your Christian life. We won't read all of them. I'll go through just a few of the verses. Hymn 394, verse 1. Jesus, I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shalt be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought or hoped or known. Yet how rich is my condition, God and heaven are still my own. Verse 2. Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. Thou art not like them untrue. Oh, whilst thou dost smile upon me, God of wisdom, love, and might, foes may hate and friends disown me. Show thy face and all is bright. Verse 4. Go then earthly fame and treasure, come disaster, scorn and pain. Can we pray that, beloved? In thy service, pain is pleasure. With thy favor, loss is gain. I have called thee Abba Father, I have stayed my heart on thee. Storms may howl and clouds may gather, all must work for good to me. Verse 6. Haste thee on from, from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged by prayer. Heaven's eternal days before thee, God's own hand shall guide thee there. Peri excuse me. Soon shall close thy earthly mission, soon shall pass thy pilgrim days. Hope shall change to glad fruition faith to sight, and prayer to praise. It's my prayer that these words are true for you in your life or that you will contemplate how they might be and that you're growing exponentially in Christ-likeness as you consider the powerful text that Paul's just presented to us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance, Father, that we don't have to worry that we're not there yet. We know we have so far to come, Lord. We know that we are darkened in our hearts and understanding that we are sinners by nature, sinners by choice, sinners by omission. And yet, Father, you have cast that sin upon your son so that we may leave it behind us. And every encumbrance that keeps us from running the race that you've set before us. Help us to understand that, Lord. Help us to grow in holiness. Help us to pursue our Savior and the truth revealed about him in your word. Thank you for the way that you have cast your love upon us and the blessings that we have of being together in this place at this time. Father, may we go forth with power and zeal, recognizing that we have been called to carry forth the greatest message that ever has been given on this earth the message of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that privilege. We pray you would encourage our hearts and strengthen us, and that all these things you may be glorified, not so that we may be seen as holy or righteous or even good, but that people would see you 
and they would know that the reason that we are different is because you have cast your affection upon us. And we praise you and give you thanks for all of this because it indeed is all your work. And we pray this in Jesus' name.